The lasting ringing is ear-splitting, almost as much as the sound of the explosion that rang out only seconds before. The detective looks around, trying to squint through the dust cloud obscuring his vision. A few other figures are stumbling around in confusion. Others are paralyzed with terror, or are worriedly trying to regain their hearing out of fear they have been permanently deafened by the blast. One or two stagger to their feet, climbing out of the debris, and run away as fast as their sprained ankles would allow them to, and the rest aren't lucky enough to still be able to move without help. In minutes, the fire and ambulance crews arrive, clearing rubble and helping the injured to safety. The detective sits on a cinder block and waits for everyone else to be tended to first. He's still got his health, which is more than can be said for some. He scans the area, looking at the mess of debris and destruction. He feels his brain doing the thing already, looking for patterns in the rubble. His eyes fall over the dusty, dumbstruck faces of the people being helped by the paramedics, ticking off those he saw moments before the explosion. He's reconstructing a list from a few seconds of glances, trying to figure out which of them caused the explosion. Whichever face was missing from the ones he'd seen when he'd walked into the baristas that morning was probably the one who did this. The detective mutters something to himself about never getting his morning coffee. Barely a few days pass before the next explosion is reported, someone's apartment this time around. Luckily, there'd only been one person at home, and nobody in the adjacent homes was harmed. The detective is one of the first on the scene, rushing across town to get a look at the blast site. The previous time, his ears were ringing too much, the shock of being so close when it happened, scrambling all the senses that had been honed over decades on the job. Today, he wants a clearer look. His heart sinks to see the bomb squad have beaten him there. The detective scoffs. They couldn't have been all that good of a bomb squad if they were showing up after an explosion had already happened. Still, it doesn't deter him. He marches up to the hazard tape hanging in a cross in a doorway, with the bottom half of what used to be a door barely clinging to the hinges. Cordoning off the area to the public is hardly going to stop a man of the law. The detective flashes his badge to the fresh-faced beat cop standing guard when he protests, telling the younger officer to let him pass. The officer tells him he's under strict orders not to let anyone in until the bomb squad has gathered all the evidence they need. Peering through the vacant doorway, the detective finds himself barking another question at the officer. Just who is the man who's been allowed inside already? A figure is standing in the wreckage of the apartment, his plain clothes making it clear he's not part of the bomb squad. He's just looking around the ruined room, a forlorn expression on his face while the bomb squad gathers up forensic evidence. The officer explains, as best he can with the limited information he's been given, that the mystery man is some kind of specialized consultant. He arrived with clearance much higher than the city beat cop had ever seen in his brief tenure on the street. He'd been warned that interfering with this man would constitute a crime worse than committing a felony. So the officer had let him through, no questions asked. It was above his pay grade. The detective storms past, the officer's hand blocking him from stepping the threshold into the destroyed apartment. Stopping in his tracks without crossing the cordon, he calls out to the consultant. He asks what's going on. Two explosions in the same week is hardly a normal occurrence. The consultant doesn't even look over to the detective, just lets his questions hang in the air like the few particles of dust catching the sunlight as they drift through the apartment. The detective is met with a warning from the chief the moment he returns to the precinct. He mentions getting a call from someone important but fails to divulge who. Noticing his former partner is nervous, even trembling, the detective pushes him for more information on who's swept in and taken the reins of the investigation. How does an outside consultant have the kind of clearance that this one does? Was he a Fed? Something even higher up in the law enforcement food chain than that? CIA, NSA, Pentagon? Every question yields no further answer, just agitates the chief almost to the point of exploding himself. The detective drops the subject, but doesn't intend to let it go. No less than a day later, yet another explosion rocks the city. This one is on the bottom floor of an office block, causing a window to get shattered, but mercifully, not much more damage than that. And the detective is ready this time. Sitting in his car waiting, he races over to the scene, getting there before even the first responders. But he doesn't get out to be the first to look. Instead, he waits, watching the scene as cops, paramedics, and firefighters arrive. The bomb squad follows not long after, and sure enough, with them is the consultant. From a distance, the detective watches. Something is off about the man. He's too calm, like all of this is ordinary for him. But it's more than that. The consultant looks almost sad, as if he's not only seen this happen before, but that he's crestfallen to know it's happened again. 
the detective waits. Clearing the scene takes hours, and a few more beat cops are left on guard to keep civilians away from the blast site. The entire time, the detective's eyes are fixated on the consultant. He wants to know where he's going next, so he can follow. He tails the consultant as he leaves the scene, keeping at a distance that won't make him too obvious. All he has to do is wait for the crowd to thin out, or for the consultant to walk down somewhere quieter. An alleyway would be perfect. Seeing his target cutting through the crowd towards a quiet, narrow back street, the detective seizes the opportunity and weaves between oncoming pedestrians. He turns the corner and walks right into the consultant. The other man stops, recognizing the detective's face after a split second, then turns to run. The detective races after him as fast as his legs will take him, fingertips reaching for the consultant's coat. He grabs him and causes the consultant to stumble. He threatens the detective that he'll never see the outside of a prison cell for even daring to interfere. So the detective snipes back. If that's the case, then the consultant might as well explain himself. After all, if he's sent to prison, the detective can hardly tell anyone. For a moment, the consultant actually seems to be entertaining the idea. Then he introduces himself under the name Tarrant. When the detective asks him what's been causing all the explosions around the city, Tarrant gives him a straight answer. Hot chocolate. Not many detectives would ever consider hot chocolate to be a cause of death. Maybe if it had been poisoned or was more than scalding hot. But even the world's top forensic analysts would in all likelihood laugh at the possibility. But then again, in their line of work, they never have to contend with the anomalous. There are experts for cases like those. SCP-5073 is not, as it turns out, a highly poisonous substance or an existential glitch caused by some mad reality warper. It is, however, hot chocolate. As far as anyone can tell, there is absolutely nothing differentiating it from an otherwise ordinary cocoa powder-based drink, other than the effect it has on people. Nothing differentiating SCP-5073 from normal hot chocolate actually couldn't be more accurate as even the packaging containing this extremely hot drink seems to resemble that of legitimate brands. The packets that the anomalous powdered hot chocolate mixture is found in seem to have been almost intentionally circulated among popular brands, possibly in an effort to fatally trick consumers. Some packets have even been found sold within boxes containing other packets from legitimate hot chocolate brands. Normally, one packet will be sold alongside those that are otherwise safe for human consumption. Foundation efforts to trace this back along the distribution chain are still ongoing. There are still numerous agents who are currently embedded within various companies responsible for the manufacture of hot chocolate powders and the shipping of these products to retail outlets. At present, shipments containing SCP-5073 have only been uncovered in the Western Hemisphere, in a distribution pattern of one packet of SCP-5073 per one million units of normal hot chocolate mix manufactured. The powder itself bears no obvious difference to look at either, although it can be slightly stickier and often generate a slightly warm sensation. These minor differences, however, has seemingly been able to remain undetected to those who have unknowingly consumed SCP-5073. After all, you have to be some kind of maniac to touch your hot chocolate powder with your hands. Use a spoon, you heathen. The powder within SCP-5073 is, as far as anyone can tell just by looking at it, identical to the cocoa powder in other chocolate beverages. However, when examined far closer on a microscopic level, there are a few irregularities that the average consumer might not notice, but a researcher of the SCP Foundation might. In particular, the granules of SCP-5073 are surprisingly durable, implying that they may not actually be cocoa but some other substance that has yet to be identified. And yet again, they seem to also generate a low level of warmth. SCP-5073 powder doesn't react the same way that other cocoa-based powders do when added to liquids. While usually, hot chocolate is designed to dissolve in milk, or water if you still haven't learned your lesson from before, SCP-5073 does not. Instead of the granules breaking up in the way you'd expect, they instead remain together. They will stay suspended below the surface of the milk, keeping the undissolved anomalous powder hidden from view. While submerged, SCP-5073 will then exude a liquid that seems to resemble chocolate in smell, taste, and color, flavoring the milk and changing it from white to brown. This leaves a beverage containing SCP-5073 completely identical to a typical cup of hot chocolate, even down to tasting indistinguishable from the real thing. 
Those who consume SCP-5073 do not suffer instantaneous death the second they take a sip. In fact, those who do drink a nice warm of the anomalous chocolatey drink often enjoy, perhaps even a little too much. Individuals who have drunk SCP-5073 have been recorded as finding it to be unusually appealing and often all describe it in an uncannily similar way. Choices of adjectives seem to always revolve around phrases such as the drink having an explosive burst of sweetness, an explosion of taste, or similarly worded variations on this sentiment. This is also always considered a positive factor too, and those who consumed SCP-5073 will never describe the flavor of the anomalous beverage as being too overwhelming or overpowering, regardless of whether or not they typically enjoy hot chocolate. They also express another unusual side effect, and that is the sudden compulsive need to drink more of SCP-5073 after their initial tasting. Analysis by Foundation researchers has indicated that there are no inherent addictive properties to the powder, but this doesn't deter those who have consumed it to drink enough of it to use up an entire packet of the powder, even if the amount within is enough to mix into several cups worth. Then there are the more fatal side effects. Normally occurring within a window of two to three hours after consumption, a person who has drank SCP-5073 will inevitably explode. No, this isn't a euphemism or any attempt at hyperbole, they will, very literally, detonate. This isn't just hot chocolate, it's explosively hot chocolate. As far as Foundation experts have been able to determine during testing, this explosion occurs within the digestive system of an affected subject. The cocoa granules that remain intact when a person drinks the SCP-5073 infused hot chocolate will suspend themselves inside the subject. These granules will remain at a concentration above the LEL for cocoa dust, short for the lower explosive limit, the lowest possible concentration of a gas or vapor to explode if ignited. This leaves a person in an understandably volatile state, of course. Any introduction of heat or open flame could ignite the cocoa dust and trigger an explosion. Surely though, this isn't too much of an issue unless someone happens to be a professional circus fire eater and are about to perform their highly flammable act after a warm mug of SCP-5073. Or rather, it wouldn't be too much of an issue if there was any way to prevent the granules from igniting on their own. Staying above their LEL concentration, the SCP-5073 particles will rub together while inside a subject's stomach. These granules are able to generate sufficient intense friction between them enough to ignite. Once this occurs, a dust explosion will erupt from within the unfortunate subject with enough force to blow their body apart. The result is often… messy. Given the sheer magnitude of the explosion caused by SCP-5073, detonation can also pose a potential danger to any nearby buildings or other infrastructure, as well as threaten the safety of bystanders surrounding the affected subject so best to stand at a safe distance. Upon examination of the aftermaths of these explosions, SCP Foundation forensic teams have determined that the sweet liquid produced by adding SCP-5073 to milk is left behind among the remains of the deceased subject, given that detonation typically occurs before full digestion is possible. And, well, you try digesting something after your stomach and the rest of your body has blown up. However, it seems that after someone who had consumed SCP-5073 has expired in an explosive fashion, any of the remaining powder will disappear through anomalous means, as well as the packet it was contained in. In addition, and perhaps most unsettlingly, a considerable amount of the subject's body mass normally is missing from their remains, more than would typically be missing after a dust explosion. A few things of note in order to protect yourself from the risk of accidentally drinking SCP-5073. For one, instances of this anomalous hot chocolate will never, repeat, never be found with additional toppings. That means anything with marshmallows, whipped cream, either chocolate or rainbow sprinkles, graham crackers, or a combination of all the above if you're really decadent, are considered safe and advisable to drink. Secondly, SCP-5073 will remain inert and non-explosive unless it is mixed with milk. Combining it with any other liquids will not render it dangerous, and if you happen to be lactose intolerant, then you're likely safe from sudden hot chocolate-related combustion. Similarly, if the SCP-5073 powder is left as it is, or if, for some deranged reason, someone ingests it as it is, it will continue to remain inert. Adding it to milk and then ingesting the resultant mixture is the only certain way to ensure detonation. 
Since first discovering the disastrous effects of SCP-5073, Foundation analysts have carefully monitored any and all reports of spontaneous human explosions or anyone thought to have died due to an internal detonation. The Foundation will then dispatch agents to conduct covert investigations in order to determine whether or not these deaths have any connection to the consumption of SCP-5073. If explosively hot chocolate is confirmed to have been the cause of death in any of these cases, the Foundation will issue an appropriate cover story to keep this information from the public. The number of deaths that took place during a redacted time frame was what initially drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-5073. Their assets embedded within law enforcement and emergency services take notice of a number of reports involving human beings exploding and begin investigating. The cause was soon determined to be anomalous hot chocolate. However, within a week, the deaths associated with SCP-5073 appeared to stop. Without any of the cocoa powder recovered intact, the Foundation considers SCP-5073 to be neutralized after six months without incidents. But researcher Tarrant isn't convinced. In an informal research log, Tarrant expresses his overwhelming concern that this situation isn't over. At this point, there is no physical evidence of SCP-5073 other than the trace amounts of extremely sweet hot chocolate recovered among the corpses that the ballistic beverage left in its wake, or rather the scattered smithereens of corpses. Despite his fellow researchers seeming convinced that they had already solved the mystery of the explosively hot chocolate, Tarrant remains unconvinced. Based on the forensic evidence pointing to a dust explosion and eyewitness accounts that SCP-5073 had been contained within packets identical to existing brands, there was a working theory about exactly how people were unknowingly consuming the deadly drink. According to the theory, an unknown anomalous prankster was responsible for slipping the self-igniting cocoa powder into the hot chocolate being sold in stores. It was seemingly designed to be sweet enough that a victim would be sure to drink enough in order to explode, and the only reason these incidents had stopped was that this murderous prankster had gotten bored. However, researcher Tarrant was adamant that this theory was wrong. He thought it seemed far too elaborate of a method to eliminate people via explosion, and the idea that these were the actions of a deranged prankster just didn't seem to add up. Although aware that not all anomalies abide by a sense of logic, if someone had engineered SCP-5073, then it would need to make more sense. As far as the researcher can see, there is no sense in making people explode through this method. With that in mind, Tarrant starts to draw his own conclusions about the explosively hot chocolate. He saw discrepancies in the Foundation's prankster theory. The idea that this person got bored and gave up so easily didn't make sense to the researcher. If this supposed prankster had been worried about a Foundation investigation, they probably wouldn't have started exploding people at random to begin with. Tarrant wondered if another external factor was the reason the explosive deaths abruptly stopped. The month that had followed the initial week of SCP-5073 incidents had been unusually warm for so early in the year. Warmer weather means fewer people drinking hot chocolate, and researcher Tarrant thought that if whoever had engineered SCP-5073 had been attempting to meet some kind of quota for the number of victims, then there'd be less opportunity with the weather being hotter. The packets disappearing also bothers researcher Tarrant. If someone had the ability to make physical evidence vanish at will, then why would they use such an elaborate method to blow people up in the first place? Speaking of physical evidence, why not also remove the victim's remains too? That's where Tarrant makes his alarming discovery, something that had previously been concealed by how much the corpses had been blown apart by their internal explosions. He notices there's more meat and bone missing than there should be, and what's left has tiny bite marks on it. A year passed before incidents involving SCP-5073 explosions began again. Although several more lives are lost as a result, the Foundation is at least able to recover intact samples of the anomalous hot chocolate powder that they can analyze, with researcher Tarrant heading up the effort to learn more about SCP-5073. Foundation analysts notice a sudden surge in similar social media posts from areas where the latest explosions take place. All of the posts seem to revolve around sightings of tiny brown spiders. Foundation field agents draw their handguns, aiming them at the woman and the hapless intern. Those fools have no idea how dangerous the coffee machine is. They could print a biological weapon that could wipe out half the globe, a volatile chemical that could explode and take out half the block, or some monstrous, gelatinous creature that could slither out of the coffee cup and become an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario by the end of the afternoon. 
The field agents thought that the woman and the intern were plain stupid to be messing with a device this powerful. Little did they know, the duo were actually much, much more stupid than that, as the woman's handbag full of sloshing black printer ink would imply. But could one final cup from SCP-294, a bubbling green cup of mysterious liquid, save them from the pair of ruthless advancing Foundation field agents, or would it make everything catastrophically worse? And to think, it had all been so normal just a few hours ago. The intern tells her that they're being watched. The whisper came from behind the woman's shoulder so suddenly that she spilled the stack of papers piled high in her trembling arms. Every office drone in every cubicle turns to look at her at the same time, like a swarm of drab zombies. Only, instead of getting up to come and eat her brains, they all start tutting and muttering to themselves passive-aggressively. The woman spins around and glares at the intern. He's way up in her personal space, with wide, anxious eyes that dart all around the office. He dives behind a fake plant and beckons for her to join him. She does not. She simply asks, annoyed, who's watching them? She doesn't bother keeping her voice down, which only panics the intern more. He shushes her, grabs her arm, and drags her behind the plant too. She barely knows this kid, had one awkward interaction with him in the break room a week ago where he talked at her about something called Battlestar Galactica, and since then, he'd latched onto her. Every meeting she went into, he'd sit beside her. Every lunch break, he'd happen to be in the elevator with her as well. She was getting real sick of it. He tells her that it's not safe, that they need to go to the basement. He said the word basement like it was some kind of government classified secret. She has absolutely no desire to go down there with him, but annoyingly, she has to go down there to mail a letter. The woman stands and turns to the room at large. He manages to jump through the closing doors behind her and starts wringing his hands nervously as they descend. The doors open, he checks that the coast is clear, and then takes off quickly down the corridor. Refusing to be a part of this whole charade, the woman walks extra slowly behind him. The basement's dusty, no one ever really comes down here anymore. All it is is one long corridor with the elevator on one side with some emergency stairs and a coffee machine on the other. Halfway along, there's a trash can and a mail chute. That's it. It seems like the cleaners don't even really bother with this part of the office. The pair of them stop by the coffee machine, the woman leaning against it with arms folded, the intern running nervous hands through his hair. We've been infiltrated. <laughs> the woman laughs at how seriously this kid is taking his little conspiracy. Infiltrated, they work for an asset distribution and holding logistics company. Even she doesn't really know what they do here. What could anyone possibly hope to gain through infiltrating this place? The intern nods his head sideways so subtly she totally misses it the first time around. He does it again, more obviously. The coffee machine? He's nodding at the coffee machine, like a maniac. The woman strides off back towards the elevator, tossing her letter down the mail chute as she goes. The intern is calling out after her, babbling away about covert agents, hidden cameras, and corporate espionage. She just lets him talk as she hits the button to call the elevator. In a desperate attempt, he seems to change tack, asking her if he can get her a drink from the machine. She laughs. There isn't a drink in the world that will convince her to entertain this conversation. The elevator arrives. The doors slide open. The intern says that there has to be something. The woman looks back at the intern. For some reason, he looks genuinely serious in his offer. She lets a dry smile spread across her face. She asks for lemonade, freshly pressed, homemade, from her hometown in Arizona. Two spoonfuls of sugar, ice, and a sprig of mint. But to her surprise, as she steps into the elevator, the intern seems to take the whole set of instructions in his stride, punching them into a keypad on the coffee machine. The woman hits the button for her floor just as the drink starts pouring out of the machine into a paper cup. That's strange. It does look like lemonade from here. A sprig of mint drops into it as the doors start closing. The intern snatches up the cup and rushes across to her, but he's too far away. The doors are closing, closing, closing. The woman jams a foot in the door, and they open back up again. The panting intern stands in front of her, holding out the cup. Large ice cubes, a light fizz, and a sprig of mint. No way. She takes a sip, and a wave of nostalgia washes over her. Memories of childhood summers, of a world happier and brighter than this one, full of laughter, joy, and beauty, where grass tickled between her toes, the summer breeze gently cooled her back, and the sun lit up the world before her with warmth and hope. The woman looks up at the intern, surprise on her face. That is, without question, hand-pressed lemonade from her hometown in Arizona. 
How had he done that? Did that coffee machine really stock lemonade? She marches over to it and stares at the machine, taking in all the details. For all intents and purposes, it looked like any other coffee machine. It's just a regular old silver and black box that you'd find in dreary offices across America. Except, actually, there is something strange about it. It has a keyboard. Not just a number pad, but a full-size QWERTY keyboard with an enter key right there. The screen simply says, enter your order now. The intern is at her shoulder, still glancing nervously back along the corridor. No one's here. Yet. Feeling a little ridiculous, but unable to deny the cup of lemonade in her pocket, the woman types out the first drink she can think of. Coffee. The intern laughs at such a boring request and tells her to use her imagination. So, she does. It takes a while, she hasn't used her imagination in years. Working in a place like this, there's little reason to ever get it out of its cage. After a few seconds of thought, the most exotic thing she can think of is… Vanilla Milkshake. She hits the enter key, immediately a paper cup drops into place, and out of the nozzle pours a thick, milky liquid with tiny black flecks in it. She takes a sniff, takes a sip, and then takes a gulp. That's a milkshake, no two ways about it. And a pretty good one at that. She laughs and turns to the intern. This is the most fun thing to happen in this office since Keanu Reeves almost came into the lobby, but then realized he was in the wrong place. She'll have to tell everyone about this upstairs. It'll be the talk of the office. But the intern grabs her arm as she goes to leave and pulls her back. There's a very serious expression on his face. Without a word, he pulls her back over to the machine and starts typing. Gasoline. Without hesitation, a new cup appears and now pours a shimmering fluid that hits the woman's nose so quickly she can identify it straight away. Covering her nose, she stares at the cup incredulously. Why would a drinks machine be able to dispense something like that? The intern is fuming with himself. That cup of gasoline stinks to high heaven. If they're being watched and suddenly start walking around the office holding a cup of gas, they'll be found out in an instant. That reminds the woman. Wait, so who is it who's following you? He first noticed it three weeks ago. Being an intern, it was his job to hand out the mail to everyone in the office. In a business spanning 13 floors, he was one of the only employees to actually regularly visit each floor. Most people would go to their same desks every day, sit next to the same people, then go home, blissfully unaware of the hundreds of others sitting above and below them, but not him. Every morning, the intern would do the rounds, going from bottom to top floor one by one, handing out the post to each cubicle. Only a handful of people bothered to talk to him, and so he really noticed all of a sudden when one of them stopped showing up to work. A mother in her mid-fifties, stable life, stable marriage, she'd always been very warm towards him. But one day, when he rounded the corner, she was gone, replaced by a man in a very neat pressed black suit, dry cleaning tag still hanging from the collar. Not thinking too much of it, the intern had gone about his week a little sadder, but generally unconcerned. Unforeseen circumstances happen all the time, especially in an office this big. But then another employee, a grumpy old man from accounts, was suddenly gone, replaced by a young woman in a neatly pressed new suit. The tag in the waste paper basket by her desk had the same dry cleaner's logo on it. One by one, dozens of employees were being mysteriously replaced, and all of the workers, too zombified by their jobs, hadn't even noticed. These new employees could only be one thing, undercover agents. But whose undercover agents remained a mystery. The closest that the intern had got was when he overheard a pair of them saying something about a foundation, whatever that meant. The intern turns around and starts typing on the keypad, gold. And sure enough, quick as a flash, a paper cup appears and out of the nozzle pours a thick, shimmering golden liquid. The woman stares at it in disbelief. It couldn't be. She reaches down to take it, but can't. It's heavy, really heavy. Is that really? He nods. He explains that he hasn't got a clue why it isn't hotter to the touch. It doesn't feel any hotter than a cup of coffee would, or indeed how it doesn't destroy the cup since it's just a regular paper one. But he'd taken it home, poured it into a cake tin, where it solidified into a brick. The jewelers in town took a look at it for him the next day and confirmed that it was the real thing. 24 karat gold, one paper cup worth. The woman takes the cup and types the word in again, hitting enter. Another cup of liquid gold pours out. She does it again, and again, but on the sixth time she hits enter, nothing happens. No air message, nothing. 
The intern explains that you can only do it 50 times in one go. Then you have to wait for an hour and a half for it to restock. The elevator doors open. Two people in pressed black suits step out through the doors and spy the pair of them immediately. For some reason, the woman's first instinct is to take off running, but she stops herself just in time, trying her best to act cool with five cups of liquid gold in her hands. From where they are, these must all look like regular cups of coffee she's collecting for a drinks round, but if they get much closer, the agents start walking toward the woman and the intern. All four people in this interaction are doing their absolute best to act casually. None of them are really succeeding. There's a trash can exactly halfway between them all. She needs to get there first and dump the cups before anyone can look inside them. Taking off at a hurried but hopefully not panicked trot, she starts throwing as much corporate jargon at the intern as she can. He falls into step beside her, engaging animatedly in the discussion of quarterly growth and stagnating markets. The trash can's getting closer. It'll be close. The agents stop and block off the corridor. Pretending not to see, the woman keeps walking, dumping the cups in the trash and trying not to think about how many thousands of dollars she's just thrown away. In the most confident and off-handed voice she can, she says, Excuse me and walks right between the agents and off towards the elevator. As the doors slide closed, she sees the pair of them going over to the coffee machine and looking at it curiously. Do they know? She mutters the words under her breath, trying her best not to let her lips move. No. The intern is trembling with fear. Why are they here then? The intern says nothing. Instead, getting out at her floor and walking pointedly over to her desk with her, he jabs a finger on a copy of the day's paper. 5.8 million worth of gold vanishes from locked bank vault. The woman's blood runs cold. She looks around the office for a quiet corner and pulls the intern across to it. So the machine wasn't just making gold from thin air, it was transmuting it from some other location. How much had the intern been stealing? He doesn't answer the question, instead just looking more and more nervous. In just 20 minutes during her lunch break, she had become an accomplice in the largest bank heist her city had seen in living memory all while standing by a coffee machine. The nerves start to hit her in earnest now. Her eyes dart around the office, looking from face to face. There are a lot of pressed black suits around, a lot of eyes subtly looking back in her direction. She goes to sit at her desk. An hour passes as slowly as molasses. Her nerves build. Another hour. The intern appears at her desk suddenly and tells her the worst possible thing she could hear. He hasn't just been taking gold. Her head whips around to face him. He can't be saying all of this right here. They're being watched. Anything valuable I could think of that you can have in liquid form. I, diamonds don't work. I've tried, but anything liquid. The problem is it's all clearly come from somewhere. Banks, government facilities, research stations. They must have triangulated that everything going missing has happened near here. She hushes them as quickly as she can, but it's too late. From the subtle movements that employees across the office are making, it's clear that they're onto them. She needs to come up with a plan fast. What can she do? What can she do? She looks this way and that. Only one thing sticks out to her. A little red switch on the wall. She punches the fire alarm, and in an instant, the alarm blares throughout the building. Sprinklers blast her with cold, stinking water, and people all across the floor cry out in surprise. The assistant to the regional manager gets up and begins conducting the fire procedure with his usual enthusiasm to the groans of all the employees. In the chaos, the woman grabs her handbag along with the intern's arm rushes him down the stairs. They push their way through the swarm of drab suits, apologizing the whole way. If anyone follows them here, they'll be breaking cover. Should buy them a moment to... The woman kicks open a side door and drags the intern after her. It's quiet down here. They'll take the back route to the basement. It should be empty down there. She hasn't got the heart to tell the intern that she doesn't have a plan, she's just winging it. Glancing over her shoulder, she spies a couple of faces peering at her through the door they'd just come through. It's the agents that had seen them at the coffee machine earlier. They'll need to be quick. Running down the flight of stairs to the basement, the woman and the intern rush over to the machine, panting hard. She orders him to put in as many orders as he can. The intern looks baffled. What does she mean? She tells him to get as much value as he can carry, preferably something that you can pour into a handbag without it burning through. He struggles to think of anything. He can't do gold. It would be too hot when it left the cup. Too heavy. He has an idea and starts typing furiously. Cup after cup pours out of the machine, and he puts paper lids on them and he dumps them into her bag. It looks black at first, but there's a slight shimmer to it. Printer ink. It's the most valuable liquid per liter in the world. He saw it on TikTok. But how in the world were they supposed to sell it? 
but the woman guesses she'll have to worry about that later. The door at the far side of the corridor has opened. Out step the two agents. What are you two doing down here? The fire alarm's going off. The agents drop the facade and draw pistols from beneath their suit jackets. The coffee's that good down here, huh? They don't smile with their joke. The intern tugs at her sleeves. She brushes him off. Not now, she needs to think. It's great. Wow, what a comeback from her. Turns out she's not so hot under pressure. A cup appears in her hand. The intern has shoved it there. She glances down. It's a clear, slightly green liquid, shimmering a little too much in the light. He nods at her. I would drink that if I were you. The agent raises his gun, his partner following suit. Here goes nothing. She slams the drink back in one gulp and raises her arms in the air. Both agents stop dead, aiming down their barrels ready to fire. But the woman suddenly feels an enormous sense of calm washing over her. Agents Jones and Hilton, I would kindly ask that you lower your weapons. My name is Professor Kane. I have clearance level five and am in charge of this operation. The agents both doubt themselves all of a sudden. The name Kane is ringing bells in both of their minds. You don't look much like Professor Kane. Ha! <laughs> Charming. That's because I've been off on maternity leave for the previous few weeks. Childcare will bring out the gray hairs like nothing else. Agent Wilkins and I are taking this opportunity to conduct first-hand research on the nature of this particular SCP, and I would kindly request you give us the time and space to conduct our research. Research I might add that neither of you have the clearance to be a part of. The two agents look sheepish. They glance at each other, then holster their weapons. With mumbled apologies, they hesitantly make their way back towards the back stairs. As soon as the door closes, the woman swivels round and looks at the intern. What on earth had he given her? The machine answers her question. One cup of knowledge of the entire secret operation. They grin at each other, the intern taking a sip of a matching drink for himself. The knowledge entered both of their minds. They had five minutes to get everything they could from the machine before those two SCP Foundation field agents realized what was happening. The intern looks concerned. How are they going to get all that gold out of here? How are they going to get out of here? The woman grins, pours herself a cup of gold, and tosses it down the mail chute. I reckon that looks big enough for the both of us, don't you? The researchers and guards scream in terror as the creatures run rampant through the factory. Nobody ever imagined they could be so dangerous, and all for a little live entertainment. The janitor rolls his mop cart down the hall of his brand new workplace. It's his first day on the job, and he would never let anyone hear him admit it, but he's a little bit nervous. The building is a huge, fancy research facility, an intimidating, sprawling building, bustling with researchers in lab coats, executives in suits, and dozens of security guards. The previous place he'd worked had cubicles in a break room with a 20-year-old coffee machine, and this place had state-of-the-art technology and keycard locks on every door. Still, he was here to do a job, and that's what he was going to do. Though he was getting distracted by the intensity of the place when there are spills to clean, and apparently, there's a big one. As soon as the janitor had clocked in, a researcher had rushed over to tell him that he was desperately needed on one of the lower levels. So here he was, rolling his cart toward the elevator, holding the researcher's keycard in his hand. His own won't work to take him down to the appropriate level. His security clearance isn't high enough. He wonders, idly, why this company has such tight security, but figures that it isn't his job to ask that sort of question. Instead, he enters the elevator, swipes the card, and hits the button for LG-1. The elevator doors open with a ding, and the janitor wheels his cart out. Right away, he notices something off about this level. There are rows of massive glass boxes, filled with what look like giant fuzzy puppets. He can hear the usual sounds of chatter and footsteps, but there's also the clucking of chickens, the bleat of a goat. Are there farm animals down here? Maybe that's the source of the mess they were talking about, test subject animals or something. He continues past the glass boxes, searching for someone who can direct him toward the mess. As he walks, he feels dozens of eyes on him and stops to glance over his shoulder. His stomach drops as he sees that the creatures he thought were puppets have moved. They turn to face him as he passed by, eyes locked onto his back. Whatever these things are, they're alive and they're all watching him. He shudders but continues walking. At the other side of the hall, he can see a huge red spill on the tile floor. His footsteps quicken as he approaches the spill, and a metallic smell fills his nose. He had assumed it was some sort of leakage from machinery, but now, up close, he can tell it's blood. 
That's it. No paycheck is worth whatever's going on here. He turns to leave, abandoning the mop cart, and comes face to face with a giant furry thing at least eight feet tall. It grins down at him, reaching toward him with outstretched arms. Before he can run, it wraps those arms around him and pulls him into an inescapable, bone-crushing hug. He struggles, but he can't break free. He can't breathe, the air squeezed from his lungs. In a halting, inhuman voice, the monster says, Teamwork makes the dream work. Then, everything goes black. About one week after that janitor's ill-fated first day at work, the local police station received a video transmission from an unidentified man reporting an emergency at the facility. No further information was given, other than the exact location of the facility and the insistence that help be sent as quickly as possible. When the police arrived, however, they quickly realized that the situation was above their pay grade and contacted an organization much more experienced with handling unusual occurrences, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly arrived, administered amnestics to all witnesses, and investigated the area. There, they found something unlike anything they had ever seen before, and for the SCP Foundation, that was saying something. All human personnel at the facility had been terminated or were missing altogether. There was still activity present in the building, however, though none of it was human. There were anomalous creatures roaming the facility uninhibited. They did not resemble humans or any known animals, but instead looked more like costumed characters from a children's television show, along the lines of Sesame Street or Barney. The site manager's office was completely empty of any files, and all hard drives found within had been wiped. Every surface had been sterilized and cleaned to remove any DNA evidence or fingerprints. The anomalous creatures were promptly captured, though they did not go without a fight. Several of the creatures were heard moving through the vents and were unable to be removed due to their speed, agility, and excretion of caustic material. In the underground laboratory spaces of the facility, the Foundation agents discovered glass tubes filled with amniotic fluid in which underdeveloped specimens were being grown. Agents also discovered containment chambers made of bulletproof glass, as well as pens filled with deceased farm animals, including cows, chickens, and goats. Once the Foundation had rounded up all of the creatures, the facility was blocked off from the outside world and given the official designation SCP-3325. SCP-3325 is an abandoned facility belonging to Real Characters Industries. The facility includes a recording studio, a series of underground laboratories, staff living quarters, storage, containment areas, and an industrial-grade incinerator. There are also several administrative areas, as well as a helipad on the structure's roof. The containment areas are home to a collection of biologically engineered organisms that bear a cursory resemblance to puppets or human beings wearing plush costumes, like those seen on children's television shows. For research purposes, these organisms have been designated SCP-3325-1. Despite their colorful appearance, which could even be mistaken for inviting and wholesome from a distance, instances of SCP-3325-1 are incredibly hostile to humans and any other organisms outside their own species. Though they are vulnerable to attacks with conventional weapons, these creatures lack any sense of pain and will continue to go after an intended target until they are effectively destroyed. In addition to their penchant for aggression, the instances of SCP-3325-1 are carnivorous and will eat any meat they are given access to. Thankfully, these organisms lack reproductive organs, so there won't be any baby plush monsters running around anytime soon. Instances of SCP-3325-1 behave in an unpredictable manner, though their most common activities are either staring at personnel blankly for long stretches of time, attempting to attack them, or repeating assorted canned children's television-friendly phrases in voices that Foundation personnel have described as unsettling and disturbing. Over the course of the initial discovery and containment of SCP-3325, SCP Foundation staff created an observation log describing all known types of SCP-3325-1. The breakdown is as follows. SCP-3325-1A long neck avian organism with feathers, three meters tall. Its wings are redundant, unable to facilitate flight. Instances are able to reach a speed of approximately 72 kilometers an hour. Aggressive behavior patterns are similar to that of a cassowary. Instance frequently damages its beak by running into objects. Color varies. 
I've encountered cassowaries before while conducting field research and let me just say, the dinosaurs never really did die out. They live on in those monstrous birds. But I digress. SCP-3325-1b Bipedal reptilian organism, observed in colors of purple, green, and yellow. SCP-3325-1c Bipedal organism covered in fur, one meter tall, able to sprint at speeds of around 60 kilometers an hour, observed to attack in packs. Upon acquiring a target, an instance will vocalize a random phrase, which elicits aggressive behavior in other nearby instances. Color varies. SCP-3325-1D Unknown organism that hides in vents. Object is able to secrete and project a corrosive fluid. The appearance of the organism is unknown. Specimens have yet to be obtained. SCP-3325-1E Bipedal reptilian organism, 5 meters tall. Constantly sings in a distorted voice. The lyrics of its song are unintelligible, presumably due to malformed vocal cords. Only one instance has been encountered. The other observed variety of SCP-3325-1 is not one specific type of organism, but rather a collection of malformed creatures characterized by the presence of conditions that, in any other organism, would cause death shortly after, if not during birth. These include but are not limited to necrosis, missing skin, tumors, additional organs in places where they shouldn't be, or other life-threatening deformations. As you might imagine, the appearance of specimens with this classification varies greatly. Following my initial research into SCP-3325, several addenda were added to the official file, consisting of several pieces of pertinent and often troubling media. The first was a brochure discovered on the floor of the facility, depicting a dissatisfied crying child standing next to a puppet, in contrast to an image of the same child laughing and clapping in the presence of an SCP-3325-1 specimen. In addition to these images, the brochure contains this text. In today's world, children are bored of animation, puppets, costumes, and even the once groundbreaking computer-generated graphics. They've seen it all. They know it's all fake. Children nowadays want more. But what is the next step in the entertainment industry? Think outside the box. We're not talking about puppets or any of those materials children know are fake. We, as humans, inherently need to associate with living, breathing creatures, not puppets or moving pictures. We're talking about real characters. Our goal is to provide children with characters that are alive, that will teach them how to manage their emotions and solve life problems realistically. You can't get more real than that. During a subsequent sweep of the facility grounds, an SCP Foundation employee discovered a videotape wedged between the wall and a large papier-mâché apple. Scrawled in pen across the tape's case were the words, We shouldn't have played God. A transcript of the videotape's contents is included in the file's second addendum, which I will attempt to summarize for you now. The video depicts an unidentified woman standing next to a green instance of the cassowary-like avian species of SCP-3325-1. Two men stand behind the camera, directing the action. Context clues suggest that this tape was intended to serve as a demonstration of the facility's characters, possibly for potential clients or investors. At the start of the video, the woman expresses discomfort with the bird-like creature, which stares at her, still and unblinking. She is instructed to say her lines as scripted, but when action is called and the actress begins to speak, the creature bites her arm. One of the men steps in front of the camera to intervene, but the entity does not respond to his commands. Even when the man begins to strike the creature with a baton, it does not budge. Instead, it bites down harder and harder until blood is drawn. Security is called, and the footage is cut short. After the first tape was discovered, the Foundation conducted several more sweeps of the property in an attempt to locate any additional media they may have missed the first time. During a search of the security room, an officer's backpack was located. It contained several personal items, including a very expired yogurt, a Nicholas Sparks novel, and a bag of sour cream and onion chips. At the bottom of the bag, however, another tape was found. This one appeared to have been surveillance footage captured by security cameras. This was particularly notable, given that all other surveillance footage found at the facility had been destroyed or corrupted, most likely deliberately. To this date, this is the only security footage successfully recovered from SCP-3325. The footage depicts two figures, presumably security guards, standing on a catwalk, looking down at containment pens filled with instances of SCP-3325-1. 
Each guard holds a long pole with a device attached to the tip, appearing to function similarly to a taser or a cattle prod. The guards talk amongst themselves, joking about shocking the creatures for fun. One guard points out a particular instance of SCP-3325-1, which is standing still and staring dead ahead. The other guard points out another stagnant creature, which appears to be staring directly at the other guard. Disquieted by this, the guard decides to knock the entity's hat off of its head. He grabs an empty bottle, throwing it at the instance. The bottle collides with the hat, but the item does not budge. Instead, it breaks open and begins to bleed, revealing it to be a part of the creature's body rather than a costume piece. The two guards begin to panic at the sight of the security camera before asking Danny in the security room to take the tape. The second guard admonishes the first for his behavior, and the footage cuts. The next addendum to the SCP-3325 file is, in the opinion of this researcher, the most disturbing. Field agents retrieved 79 steel containers from a storage area on the bottom floor of the facility. 41 of these containers contained human bodies preserved in a formaldehyde solution. Additionally, each container had documents attached, detailing each person's name and position at the company, as well as the cause of their death. Causes of death listed included mauling, organ failure, necrosis, and scheduled termination. SCP-3325 is classified as Euclid. Currently, SCP-3325 is contained on site, surrounded by a fence and guarded by no fewer than four security guards at any given time. Due to the isolated nature of the location, no further security measures have been deemed necessary. As for the specimens of SCP-3325-1, they are kept in large animal containment cells at a research sector whose precise designation has been redacted from official files. Each of these containment cells has an audio recording device inside. Each specimen is to be fed twice a day on a diet of raw meat, and no direct interaction between research staff and these specimens is permitted without first tranquilizing the entity. The effort to locate and contain all pieces of equipment associated with SCP-3325, as well as any documents pertaining to it, is an ongoing project. At this time, it's uncertain if any of us will ever know what Real Characters Industries was up to, and when it turned from an attempt to revolutionize the children's entertainment market to something far more sinister. What did the researchers discover that signed their eventual death warrants? Was the project truly abandoned, or just moved deeper underground, to a new facility staffed with fresh faces who won't ask too many questions? One thing is certain. Be wary of cuddly new characters that appear at theme parks, at birthday parties, and on screen in the coming years. It's possible that these creatures are just actors in suits, or life-size puppets, and all they want is a hug. But it's also possible that their wide, vacant eyes and friendly smiles hide an uncontrollable rage, an unpredictable intelligence, and a thirst for blood. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. 
There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow, towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular, but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the first of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. 
The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide, and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe, and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then, sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand. There's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no Ripper, he was also, clearly, no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. 
Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. 
Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting king of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the king of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive Level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly… Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged, that much is clear even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up, no matter how hard they gripped each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors, marked with signs reading, employees only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold, and more mattresses mean more food for the mob. 
The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention, everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink, with no additional context offered. Nothing to indicate what the link is, or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep-fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table, with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? 
Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy golden brown cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king-size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame, although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, a feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face his stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme and it affects them all in the exact same way becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions, but as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the Foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The Foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. 
The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The Slumber Party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1 but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, 
he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the king actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him. There are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. Looking around, though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done. But if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a ten-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out, and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot, wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, 
It looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost wretches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now. And this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. That's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams. Dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's… well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, 
but with his head injury, he can see the light starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy. Operating theater, there, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with a heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. There seems to be a parallel between high-sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives, with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. 
Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today, all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands, but he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she will heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pained grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here. And even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. 
It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I'd hope to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment discontinued item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not under any circumstances do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, 
farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not, a warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continue to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. 
Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D45782 noted that it was gelatinous looking with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D45872 became more difficult to understand, clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth. Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subject's lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in containment area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. The homeless man in the alley looks down at his arm, wide-eyed in horror. Is his skin moving? It almost seems to bubble, like water coming to a boil. He's experiencing a kind of pain he can't even imagine. He can feel something moving up against his bones, chewing through the calcium. He can't move. They're everywhere inside him, just eating. He opens his mouth to scream, but they've already chewed too many holes through his lungs for him to make a sound. Within the hour, he will be dead. But what's killing him? The store owner pulls a gleaming, serrated edge knife from the knife block, and with deft, practiced hands, he slices a delicious ciabatta roll in two. From there, he butters the bread, slices a juicy pair of New York steaks into thick, medium-rare chunks, adds in some diced vegetables and lettuce leaves, sprinkles on just a pinch of lime zest, and hey presto, he's got a delectable Caribbean-style pork sandwich. It's a thing of beauty but he can't help but feel it's missing something. Oh, that's it. The thought hits him like a lightning bolt. This sandwich would be delicious, but it'd also be far too dry. How could he have made such a rookie mistake? He saunters across the kitchen and reaches into one of the many luxuriously appointed cabinets, feeling around for one of the many jars of mayonnaise he's got stowed away in there. 
He twists off the cap with a pleasing pop and spreads a little mayo onto the sandwich. It looks positively delicious, and he wastes no time in placing it pride of place in the display case. Everything is moving along perfectly. Boston is a foodie town. That's what the store owner tells himself as he flips around the sign on the door from closed to open for the very first time. After years working as a chef in other people's restaurants, the store owner has racked up the experience to strike out on his own and achieve his dream, a boutique sandwich store on the Boston waterfront, where tourists from hither and yarn would be able to enjoy artisanal sandwiches while browsing the city's many historic locales. His employees are busying themselves around the store. They're all people he personally interviewed and selected. They all aligned with his mission and had a passion for sandwiches. One wipes down the tables in prep for the inevitable rush of customers when it turns lunchtime. Another is artfully posing a selection of pre-made sandwiches behind a sheet of glass at the counter. Leg ham and strong cheese, BLT, tuna mayo, and, of course, lobster. We can't forget that this is Boston, after all. But as the hours creep on, something horrible happens. Nobody shows up. The store owner doesn't know what he's done wrong. He managed to pay for an ad about the grand opening in one of the local papers and released some coupons in a local food magazine, too. He even put a grand opening sign and garland in the window, showing off the grand opening discount. For every sandwich a customer buys, they'll get another half off. But it seems that none of this conventional business wisdom actually shook out. His optimism wanes as the course of the day passes, and though they're all keeping up brave faces, he can see the doubt in the eyes of his employees, too. All of their minds are bubbling with the same terrifying thought, too awful to ever be spoken aloud. This whole thing has been a complete bust. When closing time comes, the store owner gathers his employees together to give him a pep talk, hoping to assuage all their fears about potentially losing their new jobs the same week they got them. He gives an inspiring speech about the importance of perseverance and grit and sticking to their dreams, despite the fact that there may be discouraging setbacks along the way. As he listens to himself talking, it occurs to him that these are the words he needs to hear as much as they are the words he needs to say. But after they've all gone home, he's left alone, looking at the uneaten sandwiches in the display case. The anxiety of the day has killed any hope of his appetite, and then it dawns on him. Those sandwiches are going to be stale by tomorrow. All his hard work, all his passion, and he's going to need to throw them out. He takes the Caribbean pork sandwich first and morosely exit out of the back door. He sees the dumpster around the back of the building, but he also sees something else. A homeless man, looking cold and hungry, wrapped in dirty sheets deep in the alley. And in that moment, he has an idea. Perhaps he can still serve a hungry person today. The store owner offers his precious sandwich to the homeless man, who gratefully accepts, deciding it would be a terrible waste to just throw food away while there was a man going hungry behind his building. He gives all the sandwiches from the display case to the homeless man, who acts like it's the first time someone has been kind to him in many, many years. He eats every single sandwich and tells the store owner that it's one of the tastiest meals he's ever had. Clearly, when it comes to making sandwiches, the store owner has a gift. In one moment, he's reminded of why he does this, making people happy with food. He has no idea that, in a sense, he's just murdered the man who rekindled his passion. The next day, things change for the better. With renewed passion and vigor for the art of making and selling delicious sandwiches to tourists and the Boston public, he puts his all into the sandwich business, and Lady Luck responds. A few customers each day at first, and then the place becomes a local curiosity, the subject of online write-ups and must-visit-in-Boston lists. There are familiar faces that he sees every single day, and it's only a matter of weeks until he needs to start implementing a waiting list for customers. Business is booming. And despite his sudden and miraculous success, the store owner never forgets what sparked his second wind. He owes it all to the homeless man out behind the store, who reminded him of his true purpose. One day, he decides he needs to repay his old friend. He whips up a delicious tuna mayo sub and steps outside to give it to the homeless man. But the man is gone. It's strange. He's left some crumpled clothes behind and the piece of cardboard he'd always sleep on. But the man is gone. The store owner steps forward, concerned for the man's safety. It had been a particularly cold and unforgiving winter after all, but he sees something instead that utterly disgusts him. In amongst the scattered clothes, there's a worm-like creature, glistening white and about a foot long. It lays there in the pile of clothes, mercifully dead. 
but the mere sight of it so revolts the store owner that he drops the tuna mayo sub onto the ground, splattering it across the asphalt. It's a terrible waste of food, but after seeing that disgusting worm thing, he doesn't have any kind of appetite for the rest of the day. If that's as terrible as this whole thing got, it would have been bad enough. But the floodgates of terror are about to open, and when it does, only a certain organization has the tools to close it. The store owner starts noticing strange things at work after that. Something about the regulars. Some of them seem kind of strange and doughy. They've got pallid skin and a vacant look behind their eyes. Some of them who've ordered the same sandwich day after day, who've memorized the menus by heart, are taking full minutes to decide what they want to order, as though the workings of their very minds have been gummed up. As disturbing as these strange little signs are, they're nothing compared to the nightmarish things a number of Boston EMTs and emergency room doctors were encountering around that same time. People collapsing in their homes in a state of extreme pain, their panicked friends and spouses calling in, crying and unable to explain what's happening to their formerly healthy loved ones. This, of course, would be disturbing enough, but what happens to these people after being taken in takes it to a whole other level. In every single case, the technicians see something moving under their skin. They take x-rays, ultrasounds, or in some cases, even make incisions, and the result is always the same. The bodies of the people experiencing these symptoms are full of thousands upon thousands of white worms eating their innards from within, slowly killing them in perhaps the most painful way imaginable. Even seasoned doctors are passing out from sheer horror when they see the masses of impossible white parasites wriggling within their patients. The one piece of vital information they don't have is that all these victims had recently eaten at a certain up-and-coming sandwich store on the Boston Harbor. After 10 weeks of business, things are starting to cool down again for the sandwich store. The owner thinks that's to be expected. That opening FOMO hype can't go on forever. But the mysterious absence of some of his most loyal repeat customers is undeniably a little disturbing to him. Is it something he did wrong? Did he somehow alienate them? These thoughts are plaguing his mind when he's alone in the store one evening, cleaning up after everyone else has gone home. His thoughts are so occupied that, as he's preparing to screw the top back onto a jar of mayonnaise, he accidentally drops it. The jar stays intact, but a large, disgusting blob of mayo splatters out onto the floor. Ah, great, now he has to clean that up. He picks up the jar and takes it into the back alley, where he intends to throw it into the dumpster. With half of it spilled out onto the ground, it's too much of a hygiene risk for him to keep it in the restaurant anymore. But before he can throw it into the trash, his arm freezes in a moment of inexplicable hesitation. In that strange moment, it occurs to him that it's the only one in the cabinet of that particular brand. He's used it on so many sandwiches before, and yet he's never needed to buy a new jar of it either. On a pure whim, he decides to inspect it closer. The label on the back of the jar reads, Water, Vegetable Oil, Vinegar, Eggs, 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 Eat Eggs, B Eggs, Your Flesh is but the nursery and sustenance of our incalculable ravenous mouths. Eat Eggs, Consume Us, Let Us Be Realized Within You. Sugar, Salt, Lemon Juice, and Love. Oh, he thinks to himself, that isn't good. Without a second's delay, he runs back into the sandwich store, wondering with horror just what exactly he'd been feeding his customers all this time. But these thoughts are interrupted when he sees that the mess of mayonnaise is somehow gone from the floor. He didn't clean it up, did he? Something is terribly wrong here. That's the only thing he knows for certain. He may not even be safe in here. He lunges out and grabs a frying pan, the one he uses to sizzle up the steak for the store's famous Boston-style cheesesteak sandwiches, and assumes a defensive position. His instincts might just save his life here, as something watches him from the shadows. Without warning, something comes squealing towards him, about the size of a rat, with shiny, smooth, white skin propelling itself along the ground on a collection of horrid little tendrils. It makes a horrific shrieking sound and lunges for him. Almost instinctually, he whacks it with his frying pan, sending it flying across the kitchen, where it lands against the wall with a splat. Did... did he just get attacked by a living blob of mayonnaise? Before he can even contemplate all the implications of that, he sees the splat slithering down the wall and gathering in a puddle on the floor. This puddle then twists and warps, taking the exact same horrible shape it had before. Tendrils sliding out of its shimmering skin, 
It must have formed out of the contents of almost the entire mysterious jar. And it dawns on him all at once, in every single sandwich his shop had served which contained mayonnaise, he's been putting these little monsters into people's bodies. And as the beast shakes off the shock and prepares to charge again, he's starting to worry that he might be in for the same fate. Only in Boston, right? Whether you love or despise mayonnaise, it's likely that SCP-2484, aptly titled The Parasitic Mayonnaise Worms, made you feel a little queasy. But if you're anything like the Foundation field agents who first discovered this caustic condiment, you likely have some pressing questions about what exactly you just witnessed. Thanks to my research into a number of classified files, I'm able to give you the answers, but I'm afraid I can't tell you that it won't get any less repulsive. To the untrained eye, SCP-2484 is a mayonnaise jar of indeterminate brand containing approximately 1,024 grams of a substance that, to all chemical tests, seems to be identical to regular mayonnaise. This substance, for the sake of avoiding confusion, will be referred to as SCP-2484-A. While inside the jar, SCP-2484-A poses no threat to anyone. But the second the anomalous mayonnaise leaves the jar or is consumed by a vertebrate animal, the disturbing effects you've already witnessed take hold. The jar contains an infinite quantity of this mayonnaise too. When the contents of SCP-2484 are removed, it will begin to refill by 2 milliliters every hour. Luckily for the Foundation's biohazard control units, SCP-2484-A can be destroyed in any manner that non-anomalous mayonnaise can be destroyed. Personally, I've never contemplated ways of destroying mayonnaise, so I'll leave the devising of these methods to greater minds than my own. Any quantity of SCP-2484-A less than 5 grams doesn't seem to display any anomalous properties, so if you're content with a tiny quantity of mayo on your food, you may encounter this anomaly and live to tell the tale. But masses between 5 grams and 63 grams are another story. These masses will develop a repulsive, congealed membrane, a kind of smooth, glossy skin over their body, as well as crude, tentacle-like pseudopods. These creatures will slither and crawl around without any real direction. These won't pose any threat to other organisms so long as they don't touch or ingest them. If only the same could be said for the larger ones. Slightly larger creatures formed out of SCP-2484-A, specifically ones weighing between 63 grams and 235 grams, will move with more direction and purpose. They will seek out solid foods and potable liquids, diffusing themselves into them and infecting them with their secondary anomalous quality, which we'll discuss shortly. Needless to say, one should avoid consuming food infected in this manner at all costs. Masses of SCP-2484-A ranging from 235 grams to 804 grams take a more direct and aggressive route to infecting their hosts. They will use their pseudopods to actively seek out vertebrate animals and try to enter their body through any means necessary from all major bodily orifices and even more novel methods of intrusion, such as pores and open wounds. But this is nothing compared to the danger presented by masses of SCP-2484-A ranging from 804 grams to 1024 grams. These creatures are highly violent and aggressive, stopping at nothing to attack and enter vertebrate animals, going as far as forcing themselves through the victim's skin. It goes without saying that these are the most dangerous types to encounter of any of them, and you may need to brush up on your methods of destroying mayonnaise that we mentioned earlier in order to survive. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that your greatest anti-mayonnaise contingency plans have failed. The anomalous SCP-2484-A mayonnaise has entered your body in a dangerous quantity, which is to say 3 grams per every kilogram of body weight. If this describes your experience, then you're about to undergo the secondary effects of this anomaly which I'm sorry to tell you are even more unpleasant than the primary effects. At first, the effects will appear to be relatively benign, including higher blood sugar levels, increased heart rate, slower cognition, and higher body heat. Not dissimilar to the effects of consuming a large quantity of non-anomalous mayonnaise. Within the body, however, things will be taking a considerably more drastic turn. The SCP-2484-A in the victim's body will begin to turn into small, gamete-like cells through some kind of anomalous force of metabolization. Then things will accelerate considerably. Within three to six hours, the cells will develop into tiny nematodes around a millimeter in length that begin swimming through the body. A single gram of SCP-2484-A can become around 500 of these parasitic nematodes. 
If that's already making your skin itch, it's going to get an awful lot worse from there. Between 5 and 40 hours after SCP-2484-A infects its hosts, whether through consumption or forceful entry, the parasitic nematodes will begin eating the host's tissues, giving them the mass to grow up to 12 centimeters long, at which point the host is likely to experience horrific pain as they're eaten from within. When the host has been entirely devoured, the parasitic mayonnaise worms will turn on each other and start eating. After all this, only one worm will be left, measuring from 20 to 30 centimeters in length. It will then enter a dormant state and die within four days. As obligate parasites, the creatures spawned by SCP-2484-A are not designed to survive outside the host body after they've developed. Any worms removed from the victim's body will die within five hours, but no attempts thus far to save anyone infected with SCP-2484-A have been successful. Infection is, sadly, invariably lethal. Our opening tale was also the first recorded case study of SCP-2484 encountered by Foundation field agents. The source was an independent sandwich store in Boston, Massachusetts, triangulated after a series of reports of strange parasite behavior over a 10-week period. The SCP-2484 jar had been in the store's refrigerator with a number of non-anomalous mayonnaise jars, though the store's owner, when questioned by Foundation operatives, could not remember ever having bought this particular jar of mayo. How it made its way into the store is, to this day, a mystery. Once the Foundation had contained the threat, all surviving sandwich store employees were given amnestics, along with a number of medical personnel who'd also encountered the parasites. All the hosts were, of course, lost. SCP-2484 is currently classified as safe. It is kept in a standard refrigerated perishables unit, essentially a kind of high-security fridge. No more than 400 grams of the anomalous mayonnaise is allowed to be removed for experimentation at any time, and no destructive tests are authorized at this time. Any personnel hoping to access SCP-2484 need to have level 3 access clearance or above. Condiments can be a loaded issue. I've personally witnessed arguments on the merits of ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise that have reached greater intensity than some Keter-class containment breaches, but I'd advise you to exercise caution. Next time you make yourself a delicious BLT and you're preparing to spread some mayo across the bread, or you're wondering which flavor will perfectly accompany your next hot dog, take a second to think. You may not know what you're really putting into your body. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. 
The two are lost in the majesty of nature. So lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you, since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. Gastrointestinal distress will pass soon and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. 
Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. 
However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattus production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. 
there was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. A construction worker puts the final nail into the wall of the room he's working on. He stands up and admires his work. This is going to be a beautiful hotel one day. A true triumph for not just him, but the entire country. And he's proud that he got to play a small part in its construction. He starts to pack up his tools. There's plenty more rooms that need work. It's a massive structure that will ultimately hold thousands. What a modern marvel. As he finishes putting away his tools, he notices something. Through the still doorless frame, he sees someone walk by in the hallway. Normally, he wouldn't think anything of it. There's plenty of other people working on this floor of the hotel, but there's something about this woman. Could it be? No, it's not possible. He takes out his wallet and opens it. Inside is a faded photograph of the construction worker when he was still a young man, barely more than a boy, really. Standing next to him in the picture is the most beautiful woman he had ever known. She was his first true friend, his best friend, and he always hoped that maybe it would turn into something more. They grew up together, shared so many experiences, but then ultimately they were separated and lost touch. He was never able to find her again, but as the picture in his wallet shows, he never stopped thinking about her. Could it really be her, though? He runs into the hallway and calls out. The woman stops at the end of the hallway and turns around. She's carrying a tall stack of boxes that are blocking her face. 
She sets them down and he sees that it really is her. They run towards each other, laughing like children, like the way they used to, and embrace in the middle of the hall. He can't believe it. It's been so many years. He never thought he would see her again. How long has it been? Too long, she tells him. He can't believe how little she's changed. The years have hardly taken any toll on her. She's just as lovely and beautiful as that last day he saw her. He asks her where she's been, what she's been doing. Is she married? She tells him no, and that after they lost touch, she feels like she has just been looking for him, waiting for the day she would randomly see him pass by on the street so that they could reconnect. She just never thought it would happen that they'd be working in the same place at the same time. The construction worker can't believe it either. They both start to ask each other something at the same time, but then stop and laugh at speaking over each other. You go first, he tells her. No, you, she responds with a laugh. Just then, they're both interrupted by the sound of a whistle. The work is finished for the day. That's the signal to pack up and go home. The construction worker tells her to wait there. He just has to go grab his tools and then the two of them can go down together. But as he turns to leave, she reaches out and grabs his hand. Wait, she tells him. He stops and turns back to her. It's okay, he tells her. I'll be right back. But she doesn't seem to want to let go of his hand. Please, not yet, she tells him. I just want you to stay with me. He looks down at his hand. She's gripping him so tight that it starts to hurt a little. Really, I'll just be a second, he tells her. Then we can go somewhere and catch up. But still, she won't let go of his hand. I need you, she tells him. She steps close to him, pressing her body against his. She closes her eyes and opens her mouth, and he feels himself doing the same. I've always needed you, she says as their mouths are about to meet. I need you forever. The construction worker screams as the tiny tendrils emerge from the woman's body and plunge into his flesh. He opens his eyes to see the girl he once knew morphing into a writhing mass of fibers, each reaching out towards him. A long tentacle-like appendage wraps itself around his legs before whipping up and around his body, constraining him as a second tentacle wraps around his head, stifling his screams before popping his head off of his body. North Korea. It's a country that's shrouded in mystery, whose government, culture, and day-to-day -day life is a black box to many foreigners. But there's another secret inside, one that even the SCP Foundation is desperate to get to the bottom of, one that they know as SCP-031. SCP-031 is a massive organism, estimated to weigh more than 7,500 kilograms, that can currently be found in a very surprising location, the Ryugyong Hotel, which is located in Pyongyang, the capital of Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The giant creature lives within the ductwork and maintenance infrastructure of the building, where it has spread to all 105 floors of the hotel. Each of its many tendrils ends in a pod-like growth called a sporocarp, which are approximately 2 meters in length and covered in many cilia-like structures. Subjects have reported that when in the presence of these sporocarp, they don't see them as the writhing mass of organic matter that they really are, but rather as an individual from their past, often with one whom they shared an intense emotional attachment. When taking this form, the sporocarp will try to convince the subject to remain with them for an extended period of time. The sporocarp will then attempt to make physical contact with the subject, and if successful, its cilia-like structures will begin injecting digestive juices directly into the subject. This will lead to the start of a process that will eventually cause their flesh to be broken down, consumed, and then incorporated into SCP-031's body mass. Unfortunately for the victim, this horrific process does not kill them. At the same time they are being digested, a flagellum, which is a tentacle-like appendage, will emerge from the sporocarp and wrap around the subject's head. This flagellum has its own set of tiny tendrils that penetrate the cranial cavity and replace the victim's brain's blood vessels, which has the effect of keeping the brain alive and functioning. The head is then removed from the body, and the brain is transported to the central mass of the SCP-031 organism, where it too is incorporated into the creature. It is estimated by Foundation researchers that SCP-031's mass contains thousands of such brains, and by all appearances, they are still alive and conscious. The Foundation first became aware of SCP-031 in 1948, following reports of police activity in North Korea at a location where multiple citizens had gathered near a refugee camp. Those gathered were proclaiming their love for a cult-like leader they referred to as the Beloved. The civilians were able to be calmed through the use of gas-based tranquilizers and amnestics by Mobile Task Force Psi-7, who then recovered a mass that would later be known as SCP-031 and secured it at a local containment site. The SCP-031 creature only weighed 75 kilograms at this time and still had a vaguely human shape, 
It did not seem to be able to incorporate other matter into its form at this point either, nor could it take on other people's forms, with its only anomalous effect seeming to be its ability to inspire intense feelings of love and devotion. The breakout of the Korean War in 1950 led to the destruction of the Foundation containment site, and all anomalies housed there escaped. Following the end of the war in 1953, all of the escaped anomalies were accounted for, all except SCP-031, which was presumed dead. Little more thought was given to the terminated anomaly until 1992, when the SCP Foundation caught wind of reports describing numerous fatalities involving workers at the Ryugyong Hotel. A mobile task force was sent to the hotel to investigate further, but after none of the members returned from the mission, the hotel was locked down and all construction was halted until further notice. By 2008, the increased infestation of the still windowless hotel led to local officials starting construction again to finish the building's exterior and hopefully hide the presence of SCP-031 within, which led to the deaths of even more workers. It's estimated that at its peak infestation, more than 75% of the hotel's 3,000 rooms were infested by SCP-031, but reclamation efforts have been able to reduce that number substantially. Flame projecting equipment is able to destroy SCP-031 tendrils and sporocarps, as well as any personnel who have become assimilated into SCP-031. Reclamation efforts are ongoing, and local officials continue to work with the SCP Foundation to facilitate the ultimate containment or neutralization of the entity. But there's one more strange twist to this story. The more astute SCP experts may have noticed the similarities to SCP-1427 a large slab of beryllium bronze with mind-altering effects that is also located within the Ryugyong Hotel. How is it that two anomalies, both of which strongly impact the human brain, are both somehow housed at the same location? Some clues exist in the form of a classified communication chain between two senior members of Foundation staff. The two discuss the obvious discrepancies that exist when there are records of two anomalies both existing at the same place at the same time, with neither file referencing the other. It leads to a strange paradox where for one to exist, the other isn't able to, and yet they both do exist. Teams sent to investigate SCP-1427 will find SCP-1427, and teams sent to investigate SCP-031 will find SCP-031. And yet the first team will have no memory of seeing SCP-031 and vice versa. When the teams were sent at the same time, they were unable to find each other, as if they were existing in parallel dimensions, each with its own version of the Ryugyong Hotel housing its own version of an SCP classified anomaly. Do both anomalies exist? Or perhaps neither of them do? Are both SCPs in fact the result of a third, as yet unknown anomaly? The answer to that question remains unknown, at least to the two senior members of the staff who were communicating about the contradictory files. Both were relieved of their duties under well, suspicious circumstances. And for the time being, both files continue to exist in the database, just as both anomalies seem to exist in the Ryugyong Hotel. For now, this Euclid-class anomaly continues to be contained as well as it can be within the ducts and maintenance shafts of the hotel's central spire. The three secondary spires each contain a Type 9 Heaven's Blade restriction system that focuses a disruptive energy field towards the central spire. This system prevents SCP-031's psychic energies from escaping the structure and affecting any off-site personnel. As North Korean teams continue to push back against the spreading tendrils in the hopes that one day, they will finally be able to open the hotel. The explorer slashes his way through the jungle, using his large machete to hack through the thick undergrowth. He suddenly stops and turns around. Which way was it again? His local guide answers, but he must wait for him to finish and his research assistant to translate. He says to continue straight, it's just another hundred yards or so. The gentleman explorer offers a quick nod, before turning to resume cutting his way through the forest. The guide was right though, because after a short way, the dense jungle suddenly opens up, giving way to a clearing that reveals one of the most incredible things the explorer has ever seen. Just ahead of him, rising out of the forest, is a massive ancient stone temple a huge step pyramid of solid stone, intricately carved and covered with elaborate statues. The colossal structure looks like it has been abandoned for centuries if not longer, with nature having done its best to reclaim the stone and cover the pyramid in vines and other plants. The team approaches the temple, but stops in front of a stone monument that stands in front of it. The explorer traces its carved lines with his finger, knocking the dirt away to reveal its weathered pictograph. It appears to depict a sort of creature but with large spread wings instead of arms. Perhaps a kind of ritualistic garb, the explorer says to his assistant. 
The assistant hastily scribbles in her notebook, trying to document everything she can. Yes, this is definitely a priest-like figure of some kind. Maybe a leader of this temple thanks to the connection he shares to their… The explorer's musings are interrupted by his guide, who he angrily spins around to face. Yes, what? What is it? His research assistant translates for him as usual. He says that we should go no further, that it's too dangerous. Nonsense, replies the explorer. We came all this way, and who knows what fantastic treasures await us inside. Historical treasures, I mean. Artifacts. Treasures of knowledge, of course. Of course, replies his assistant, before following her boss as he starts making his way up the step pyramid, as the guide holds true to his stated intentions and waits near the edge of the jungle. The two of them walk through an entrance that leads into a long, dark hallway. With only torches to light their way, it's impossible to see just how deep it runs into the temple. The explorer stops to examine the walls, which are covered in even more carvings. He can see that there are complicated geometric patterns, but also many more depictions of the same winged creature that was on the monument outside. Here though, the creatures are depicted in moments of action. They appear to be running, chasing, reaching out and grabbing for… people. They are shown attacking them, picking them up, carrying them away to… Right where the pictograph story should reveal its climax is a chunk of missing wall. It must have fallen off at some point. Ah, oh well, the explorer declares before moving on to explore more of the temple. His assistant doesn't follow though. She spots several pieces of stone on the floor underneath the missing panel and kneels down to get a closer look. She begins to gather them together, rearranging the various pieces back into their original form. Meanwhile, the explorer's attention has been caught by something else. On the other side of the hall is a statue of a tall, proud warrior, and in his hand he clutches a large bejeweled spear, the gemstones adorning it sparkling in the torchlight. The explorer reaches out and grips the spear's handle. He begins to pull, perhaps being a little rougher than one should with an ancient artifact, but he wants this fabulous jeweled piece, and even more than the spear itself, he wants the acclaim it will bring him back home. As the explorer pulls on the spear, his research assistant moves the final piece of the broken wall carving into position. She holds her torch over it to get a better look, and she gasps. The winged creatures are carrying people away, but that isn't the end of the story. They are bringing them somewhere, and she can even see now that they are being presented to an even bigger winged creature. It's a monster. A monster that is feeding on the people. The assistant turns to tell the explorer what she has found, and just as she does, she watches as he is finally able to rend the spear loose from the statue's grip. The statue finally letting go causes him to fall backwards to the ground, where he lies, marveling at the beautiful jeweled spear in his hands. Look out! yells his assistant. The explorer doesn't notice that the statue is precariously rocking back and forth, and he rolls out of the way just before it crashes down right where he was lying and admiring the spear. Are you okay? she asks as she rushes over. I think so, he tells her. Just a little bump on the head. Nothing that can't be fixed up by a good… By a good what? she asks, but he seems distracted by something behind her. By a good… by a good… by god, what is that? He points, and the research assistant turns to see something emerging from a hole in the wall where the statue once stood. It's one of the creatures from the wall carvings. A bizarre half-man, half-lizard, with wings instead of arms. Though there's no flesh at all, the creature is completely made of bone. The two of them both scream at the skeletonized half-human, and the creature screams right back at them, emitting a shrill, high-pitched squeal. Suddenly, more of the creatures begin to emerge from the hole in the wall, with others crawling out of previously unseen and unnoticed holes in the walls and ceiling. The creatures rush towards them, blocking their way out of the temple, and the pair have no choice but to run further down the darkened hallway. As they run, more of the creatures emerge from holes in the darkness, screaming at them and grasping at them with the sharp claws on the end of their wings. As they round a corner, one reaches out and grasps the explorer's ankle, causing him to trip and fall hard onto the stone floor. His assistant rushes to his aid, but as she is helping him up, two more of the creatures appear behind her and envelop her in their bony, winged arms. The explorer stands up and stabs at one of them with the jeweled spear as they drag her into a dark hole, but a third tears it from his hands. With more still coming down the hallway behind him, the explorer has to run. The hallway in front of him looks to have collapsed at some point in the past, and he has no choice but to enter one of the dark tunnels that has been carved into the rock. The narrow tunnel winds back and forth, and the explorer is unsure of where he is going or what his plan is. He rounds a bend, and the tunnel opens up into a gigantic room. The ceiling must be over a hundred feet high, and he can't see the furthest walls, with the only light emitted by his torch and a dim beam of sunlight coming down through a hole high up in the ceiling. He notices, too, 
fact that it has suddenly gone quiet. He turns and looks back at the tunnel he has just emerged from and notices that the sound of the horrible creatures that were chasing him has ceased. The explorer hears something coming from deeper in the giant room and turns back, peering into the darkness. There, in a single beam of light, he sees one of the winged creatures, but it is moving strangely, as if it isn't walking but floating up into the air, and that's because it isn't walking. As it gets closer, the explorer can see that the winged creature is stuck on the tooth of a giant, monstrous mouth. The huge winged creature emerges from the darkness into the beam of light, tossing back its giant head to consume the creature that was stuck in its teeth, its bones loudly cracking in its mouth. Now, in the light, the explorer can see that the monster, which itself must be hundreds of feet long, is a huge flying lizard of some kind. Or at least it was at one time, since now the majority of its body is made only of bone. What scraps of flesh are left hang off in rotten ribbons. The monster opens its mouth and roars at the explorer. Its foul breath smells like a mausoleum opening up, hitting the explorer in the face. The explorer tries to run, but the monster swipes out with a bony wing that still has a few blackened strips of leathery skin on it and knocks into the ground. He is pinned to the floor with a huge spiny claw as the creature opens its mouth, roaring again before moving its head down to start feasting on its meal. The explorer closes his eyes, bracing himself to be eaten alive. When the creature suddenly lets out an ear-piercing scream, the explorer opens his eyes to see the jeweled spear sticking out of one of the few spots of flesh remaining on the creature's clawed foot, and gripping the shaft is his assistant. She looks a little worse for wear, but she's alive. She offers him a hand to help him up. They need to get out of there. But first, the explorer pulls the spear from the monster's claw. The two start running, doing everything they can to avoid the monster as it claws and swipes at them. They spot an illuminated opening at the other end of the vast room, and with no other option, start heading towards it. As they get closer, they can see it's just what they needed. Daylight. Escape. They both slide to a stop at the cusp of the opening, nearly tumbling over the edge. On the other side, the tunnel opening up out of the side of the temple gives way to nothing but air and a drop of hundreds of feet down to the jungle below. They turn to see the monster still rushing towards them, and without time to think any longer, they both jump just seconds before the creature snaps its bony jaws in the place where they were standing. It's too big to fit anything more than its mouth out the door, and it howls and screams as they fall through the air before crashing into the ground below. The assistant slowly opens her eyes to see someone. It's their guide. He is cradling her head and asking if she's okay. She sits up, dazed and more than a little bruised from her fall. She asks the guide where the explorer is, if he's alright, and the guide lowers his eyes looking as though he'd rather not answer. He points next to them without looking, and the assistant turns to see the explorer lying on the ground a few feet away from them, his body impaled on the jeweled spear. History is full of tales and legends about gods, monsters, and everything in between. But not all of these are just stories, and in fact, sometimes the reality is even more terrifying than what we could envision. And that is exactly the case when it comes to SCP-4959, also known as the Teotihuacan Pterodactylactery. SCP-4959 is a huge creature that resembles a pterosaur, which were flying reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This massive anomaly, whose wingspan stretches approximately 50 meters, is in a living state of decomposition, with roughly 70% of its flesh having rotted or otherwise fallen away, leaving only small patches of skin and decaying tissue clinging to its bones. The flesh that does remain shows no signs of further decomposition though, as if it is permanently locked into this specific stage of advanced decay. Tests of 4959's flesh have shown no apparent abnormalities, save for a slightly higher than expected concentration of iridium. Its eyes are no longer present, but the eye sockets somehow shine with a bright green light, though the source of this luminescence is unknown. When angered, the creature also emits a multicolored corona of fire from its wings, skull, and neck. SCP-4959 was discovered in a gigantic chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan, Mexico. A number of tunnels connect to the chamber, and these too are anything but empty. Lurking within the temple's many twisting passages are entities that have been designated SCP-4959-A. These humanoid-sized creatures appear to be constructed of various human and pterosaur bones, creating an all-new creature that is an amalgamation of both. The bones are connected to a central stone-like heart, but it is unknown if this heart was carved from stone, 
or if it was at one time a real heart that turned to stone through a process of ossification, nor is it fully understood just how the bones are connected to it or stay together. The 4959-A entities also have a number of varying adornments on their bodies which can include strips of decayed fabric, feathers, and precious stones that resemble those worn by the indigenous people who resided in the area many centuries ago. SCP-4959 is carnivorous, though it is unknown if it requires or simply desires to feed. Regardless, it seems to be the task of the SCP-4959-A entities to bring it meals, since the 4959 creature itself is too large to leave its chamber beneath the temple. The hallways and passages that originally connected the temple to the chamber housing SCP-4959 have all collapsed, and the only tunnels now leading to it were most likely dug into the rock and earth by the 4959-A entities. They searched through these tunnels, most often working at night, looking for small animals like birds and lizards, but also occasionally finding a larger animal or even a human who has somehow found themselves inside. They will then bring their live prey directly to the giant pterosaur, offering them up as both a meal and a sacrifice. SCP-4959 will then proceed to eat the prey whole, sometimes consuming the 4959-A entity at the same time as well. The temple itself is covered in carvings and murals that give numerous hints as to the origin of SCP-4959. While it is unknown just how it got there, it appears as though the local people discovered the creature within its chamber and regarded it as an avatar of their feathered serpent god, or perhaps another unknown deity. A temple was constructed at the site, and they soon began making sacrifices to the god creature that lived beneath, starting with small animals but then progressing to human sacrifices on important holy days. There is also something else shown in the murals that looks to be of great importance. It seems as though SCP-4959 possessed a sort of heart, which is depicted as a large gemstone, described as being red as blood and bright as the rising sun. This gemstone was previously housed at the pinnacle of the temple, though its current location is unknown. Following intense study of the site by SCP Foundation historians, a narrative was pieced together that may explain at least some of what happened there. It seems as though there was an uprising within the local population in roughly the 6th century AD. A conflict had arisen amongst the people as to whether this really was a god or something else, something evil. Those who doubted the deific origins of SCP-4959 wrested control of the temple and journeyed into its depths to attempt to kill the creature. The many scorch marks on the wall are a testament to the battle that likely took place, and while they suffered many losses, it appears as though they were at least able to seal the chamber shut. It is currently unknown what became of the great jewel on top of the temple after this, but its location is of great interest to the Foundation given that it may well be the source of SCP-4959's longevity. SCP-4959 has been classified as Euclid, and it continues to be contained within the chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, though all of the tunnel entrances leading into it have been blocked by reinforced gates. If new ones are discovered as the result of SCP-4959-A's continued tunneling, they too are to be gated and sealed. Once per week, a large live animal, most often a cow, is deposited down a shaft that leads directly to the chamber, and so far this seems to be keeping SCP-4959 content to stay within its tomb. Just what is SCP-4959, and what are the half-man, half-pterosaur creatures who serve it? Are they former human sacrifices, now destined to live in eternity in servitude to their master? If SCP-4959 was a god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy means that in a sense, we are the ones serving it now. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while. 
and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? Do you expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing. But none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect. But without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel, and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful, no clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was. But he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend, and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long, black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late, and in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take. When unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material. However, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, 
SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain, latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bioresearch Area 12 where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack, but these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and, yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, 
and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. You have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond and... You scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which he can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910 but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910, and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially or perhaps entirely out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. 
These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-745, The Headlights, for another predatory creature with a very unique hunting method. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.